So Taiwan studies has a has always sat rather awkwardly within broader China studies um, for obvious reasons. You know, people who think that Taiwan is part of China think Taiwan belongs in the China studies field. People who think Taiwan is a separate thing. Uh, would prefer to have it broken apart and be something like Korea studies or Japan Japanese studies. To my mind, don't fit naturally at all in the study of the PRC, at least, as the representative of China. Um, I'm much more comfortable comparing Taiwan to Japan or Korea or other third wave democracies in, say, Eastern Europe, like Poland or Hungary. Uh, if you look around American academia, there are often jobs in departments that are dedicated to a China scholar. Almost never be a position dedicated solely to a Taiwan scholar or a Taiwan expert. Mm -hmm. And so if you want somebody who knows about Taiwan to get that position, they need to be able to convince the hiring committee that they can teach courses on China and do research on China. Yeah. But now the atmosphere is changing. It is. So one part of that is a, an increase in interest in Taiwan in the U.S. Uh, another part of that is uh, the rising competition between the United States and the PRC. A third is uh, the concern about Taiwan's own uh, security, uh, its economy, uh, and a kind of belated recognition that Taiwan is actually quite important economically to the United States. And then finally, uh, I want to commend the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the broader Taiwan government for funding programs on Taiwan in the U.S. Uh, my own program is funded uh, primarily by a grant from MOFA, but they've dramatically expanded and also uh, changed their funding model a little bit. So uh, they're endowing positions at universities. So they are creating that position that will go to someone who has Taiwan expertise. Uh, and that's a, you know, funding and a line set aside for that sort of person. And that is helping institutionalize Taiwan studies programs in the U.S. that will then provide long-term benefit for Taiwan studies. Well, I have to add something here because, <laughs> well, you know, in the internet, many people will say that blame the government that, okay, you, you cannot do this. You are funding, uh, creating so-called Yi and to <laughs> buy the support. I, I would say that it is very common, especially from Japanese government and also the Korean government, they are doing the same thing. So it is not buying some, someone to uh, do you a favor. It's not. It's an institutionalized studies uh, in the academia. So it's very common. Right. And let me just, your mention of Korea reminded me that uh, Korean studies in the United States has boomed over the last 20 years. I was astounded when I went to AAS at the number of Korea scholars and Korean panels. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that the Korea Foundation, uh, starting 20, 25 years ago, went around and endowed positions and provided funding not only for centers, but for uh, graduate students to do field work in Korea, for scholars who wanted to do a conference or a book project, and provided you know, a set of funding all the way from the time someone entered graduate school all the way to senior faculty. That foundation dramatically increased the number of resources and the impact that Korea had in the U.S. The academia. Korea foundation is sponsored by the Korean government? Partly, uh, partly also, by the government. Yeah. Okay. But also partly by private uh, sectors. The private sector, yeah. Korea has big jables, the, yeah. the, the giant uh, conglomerates, and several of those have contributed a lot of money to the Korea Foundation. And so if you wanted to build on this progress in Taiwan studies, I think the Korea model is a good one, actually. And if you could attract some private funding to match some of the public, uh, that would deepen uh, the kind of commitments that uh, you can make to Taiwan studies in the U.S. Yeah, that's kind of the soft power, right? Soft very much, much yeah. 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 And it's, let's, let's be very explicit about how this soft power works, right? The course that I teach on Taiwan, I, I try to encourage students to think about going to Taiwan as well. And in some cases, they are already here. They've arrived for the summer. They're doing internships or language study. And that cultivates then a lifelong connection to the place. And those may not go on to be Taiwan experts, but, uh, you know, they... Stanford undergrads are smart and they're headed for great things, right? This time, Carl's your visit to Taiwan is also a project to cultivate yeah, Taiwan's right. expert. So this, this working group, the U.S.-Taiwan Next Generation Working Group, is intended to fill what I see as a gap in Taiwan expertise in the U.S. Uh, so there's a, a, 
a senior generation of scholars in the U.S. who may have focused on China mostly in their research, but had a strong connection to Taiwan because they had to come here to do their language study, if, if nothing else. And that generation is mostly retired now, and they've been replaced on university faculties in the China slots and all these departments uh, with people who just went straight to the PRC for their language study mm -hmm. and maybe have never set foot in Taiwan uh, and don't have a any kind of strong connection to the place. Uh, there used to be a much deeper Taiwan bench. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the 2000s to 2010s, um, people were discouraged from focusing on Taiwan because China was booming. China was the place to go, right? And so people who took the time and really dedicated themselves to learning the Chinese language, mm -hmm. saw China as a much better payoff for that investment, right? Um, now I think the pendulum is swinging back. Taiwan is, you know, on the cover of uh, a news magazine, it's calling it the most dangerous place on earth or uh, high, high the most important as, as well. Yeah, the most important, right? <laughs> Or, or talking about TSMC, for instance, as a, a critical company. So there is some rising interest now in Taiwan, and people who uh, are investing in learning Chinese are, uh, for a variety of reasons, actually coming to Taiwan again to study it. I'm just curious. So there is a gap. For the senior uh, researcher and the uh, experts, they have more knowledge onto Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And at the middle generation, probably more focus on China. Mm -hmm. And uh, young generation, more interest in Taiwan. So this, the senior generations and the uh, young generation, they can talk to each other with uh, traditional Chinese. Well, sure. Um, yeah, some of my seniors in this field yeah. um, can remember learning traditional Chinese characters in the 1960s or 70s, right? <laughs> at at uh, uh, Da Xie down in Taichung, say, um, or at, uh, at Taida or Shida in Taipei. So they had that traditional character base before they started studying China. For me, I went the other way, actually. I learned Jian Tzu first oh. when I was in college and then went to mainland China, studied Jian Tzu there, and then came to Taiwan and had to start again, yeah. right? And I think the written one, written, written season is the most difficult part. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it's like drawing. Yes. <laughs> right, but I will say characters didn't really make sense to me until I got to Taiwan and I had to learn the traditional <laughs> forms because in the way they're put together, um, there's a just, logic behind them. There is a logic behind them and I had no kind of intuition for that until mm -hmm. I learned the traditional forms mm -hmm. and then I found it was easier to memorize and easier to read mm -hmm. traditional. So I'm, I'm biased, but I like I like, <laughs> I, I like an example that uh, in the simplified Chinese love, there's no heart yeah, for love. Oh, took yeah. it out. That, that's an example. <laughs> right. yeah. Oh, that's a really good example. Yeah. Yeah.